Hi, this is Pastor Randy. Thanks for joining me today as we have our message to remind us of Thanksgiving from our generosity series. The title of today's message is Take Hold of Life That Is Really Life. And it's inspired by the scriptures we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. Paul writes to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Paul also writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 and 9 to 11. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, last week, we talked about the importance of having a generous heart. We were created in the image of God, and God is generous, so you were made to be generous. In fact, our very happiness and joy in living may be genetically connected to our giving. Besides, if we're honest with ourselves, we will acknowledge the truth in what the scriptures say, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We don't own anything. We're merely stewards of the gifts that God has given us so that we might be blessed and be a blessing to others. Last week, I quoted Winston Churchill, who said that we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. It is my hope that you will make a life, that you will not settle for poor substitutes, but that you will take hold of the life that is truly life. Many studies have found that there is a connection between gratitude and generosity, and subsequently, the joy that we feel in living. People who are grateful for the blessings they have been given are more likely to bless others through their giving. And our overall experience of joy in life, having a life that is truly life, is related to those traits of, gen of generosity and gratitude. There's no better time for us to consider the importance of gratitude than right now as we prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving this week. Giving thanks pleases God. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 6 to 18, 16 to 18, Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. When we have a thankful heart, we are living as God wills. A few years ago, the Templeton Foundation did some research that found that those who give thanks daily give away 47% more money than those who do not. A University of Oregon study by Christine Carnes concluded, in a sense, gratitude seems to prepare the brain for generosity. Apparently, our brain literally makes us feel richer when others do well. Perhaps, she says, this is why researchers have observed that grateful people give more. If you want to make a life, take hold of a life that truly is life, you will express gratitude and thanksgiving, which leads you to be more generous. Maybe this is why studies show that religious people tend to give more money than non-religious people as a whole. One study found it to be 2.3 times more. The Templeton Foundation found that devoted believers gave 3.6 times more than non-devoted people. Students of the Bible know that God's word clearly encourages us to put others' needs above our own. Last time I pointed out that much of the advice Paul gave to his churches on generosity was a response to a terrible famine that hit the Middle East between 48 AD and the early 50s. Paul asked the new Gentile Christians in Greece and Asia Minor to help their brothers and sisters back in Jerusalem who were especially having a tough time. 
The thought was, if it were not for the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, we wouldn't be here. We would be ignorant of Jesus' teachings and sacrifice, and we would be lost in our sins. Listen to his advice in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7, to the Christian church in the Greek city of Corinth. Since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Do you excel in the grace of giving? Paul writes again in 2 Corinthians 9, 11, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous. There is a reason God blesses us. We are blessed so that we can be a blessing, so that we can be generous on every occasion. The only way we can be be prepared to be generous when the occasion arises, when the Spirit points out a need and prompts us to help, is by not spending everything on ourselves, by leaving some room in our budget by the practice of living beneath our means. Well, the temptation is to live above our means, to buy things we can't afford on credit that we can't handily repay. If I learned anything from the past year and a half of the pandemic, it's that I previously spent more money than I needed to. My priorities were rearranged by the pandemic, and so I found that I had more left over after the bills were paid, even in times when I was paid and made less. Living beneath our means makes it possible to be generous. And when you are generous, it not only blesses others, but it blesses you and it blesses God. Because as the scripture says, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. We can never know this side of heaven what the full effect of that generosity might be. But sometimes we get a glimpse. Last December at the Dairy Queen in Brainerd, Minnesota, someone paid for the meal of the person behind them in the drive through It started what was called a blizzard of giving that lasted for two and a half days. 900 people paid for the person behind them. Some even told the Dairy Queen staff to keep the change and help people later on. Not only were the customers blessed, but it also helped the store owner pay the bills, and keep her people employed during the pandemic when many restaurants were suffering or closing down. You see from this example how generosity blesses others. I wondered to myself, who broke the chain? And I discovered it was a person who did not have enough money to pay for the larger order behind him. Some people had left extra funds to help in situations like that, but they had run out. The thing that crossed my mind is, I don't want to be the one who breaks the chain. I want to be able to be generous. I want to help take up the slack for those who cannot support God's work as much as they would like right now. Don't you? Paul gave these instructions for the church in Ephesus to his protege Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 18. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God. Command those who are rich in this present world. You might be thinking right there, well, that sure doesn't apply to me. I'm not rich. But what standards are you using to draw that conclusion? The average per capita income of the world is $3,000 a year. The poverty level in the United States is about $12,000 a year. Even people who might seem poor by our standards have four times more than the average person elsewhere in the world So maybe you're more rich than you think. But the better question is, where do you place your hope? He says, to not put our hope in our wealth, but but to put our hope in God. Do you place your hope in something that is uncertain or in someone who can be depended on? In someone named Jesus. Command them, Paul writes to Timothy, command them to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God's not out to deny you the pleasures of life. Like a good parent, he wants the best for us. And he knows that sometimes we don't know what that is. But he will provide everything necessary for our enjoyment. God wants us to have food and shelter and clothing. He wants us to enjoy life. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it to the full. 
And David wrote in Psalm 23, my cup runs over. God wants to bless us, but it doesn't stop there. He wants us to be a blessing to others as well. Paul continues, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a found, firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Our generosity and our willingness to share has eternal implications. It lays up treasure for a firm foundation for the coming age. To me, that sounds like heaven. But the rewards start here in this life, in the here and now, as we take hold of the life that is truly life. The world is constantly trying to tell us about how we can enjoy the life. They try to sell us ideas about what that looks like. But the things that they say will satisfy leave us empty and hungry for something else. And they are cheap substitutes. In the end, the path to true life and lasting joy involves acknowledging that every good gift we enjoy in this life, the earth and everything in it, belongs to God, not us. We are merely given this brief span to manage these gifts, to be blessed by them in order to be a blessing to others, that others might see our good deeds and give glory to God. And it is a wonderful thing to have a generous heart. Young Jeff Hansen, a visually impaired artist in the Kansas City area, gave a million dollars to charity by the time he was only 20 years old. His total now is over $6.2 million. Gratitude was the motivation for his generosity. When he was asked why he gave so much away, he's given away nearly one third of the paintings he has made to charities for them to auction. They asked him, why did you give so much away? And he answered, I wanted to give back. And it was really fun. There is joy for those whose gratitude spills over into generosity, who put their love in action. For those who refuse the cheap substitutes that this world has to offer and focus on God's goodness and mercy and grace. For those who take hold of a life that is truly life, seeking to be more and more like Jesus. And that is the joy I want for you this Thanksgiving, a joy that flows from a generous heart that is filled with gratitude for the grace that we have been shown through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know your love by the manner in which you gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to take away our sins. We know your love through the way Jesus gave his life for us. May the world know your love by the way we give of ourselves for others. Thank you for Jesus, for your mercy, for the blessings we've known in this life. May we be a blessing for others in such a way that they will give thanks to you as well. For it's in Jesus' name and his glory that we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.